Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. How was your lunch? Fantastic. As I see, uh, some people were so eager to eat that they found ice cream machine. This is a very interesting compilation for me, a man who's been sober two years, seeing people celebrating I ice cream with a beer. Very Estonian of you. You go. And also, by the way, while we're talking about cybersecurity, I just have to point out, don't forget the physical security, the amount of, amount of people with crutches and hands that need to be repaired. I hope everything's going to be all right. And a quick reminder for the students in the room, if they are in the room, after the second part of our today's session and during the coffee break, you are welcomed at the gathering with Rushmore at the workshop room. But I'm going to remind you that at the end as well, because I've been a school teacher. I know how it works. Now, we kick off our second part of the presentations with discussion of security risks in GitHub. And uh, we are going to hear about research based on Sync Security Lab's work and suggestions and case studies uh, to help secure GitHub. So please welcome with Action Anomalies, a hacker's guide to GitHub actions, Mr. Elliot Ward. Cool. So thank you uh, all for yeah, coming to this. Uh, my talk is, yeah, Action Anomalies, uh, a hacker's guide to GitHub Actions. Um, and this is based off yeah, some of the research that we've yeah, done recently. Um, but kind of just first, we have the obligatory who am I slide. Uh, so my name's Elliot, and I'm from the UK, but living in Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, it's my first time here in Estonia, so it's really cool to come and yeah, visit your city and country. Um, yeah, I'm a skateboarder, snowboarder, um, and when I'm not hacking or skateboarding, uh, I'm playing probably too much RuneScape. Um, so if there's any RuneScape players out there, uh, be yeah, let me know. Old school RuneScape, not RuneScape free. Um, so that's me. Um, and kind of just to go over what we're going to talk about today. So we'll very briefly introduce Sneak and who Sneak uh, Security Labs are and what we do. Uh, and then we're going to kind of go over what GitHub Actions are. We're going to look at what the threat landscape is and kind of some of the misconfigurations and vulnerabilities that this can lead to, uh, followed by uh, yeah, presenting some findings and the GitHub Action vulnerability scanner that we wrote to uh, perform our scanning on mass, basically. And then we'll look at a couple of countermeasures. So if you're in a, a security engineering team uh, or a developer, then uh, you can avoid making these mistakes, basically. So kind of just to briefly introduce Sneak. Uh, so it, it's not a sales pitch, but if you don't know who we are, we're a software security company, and we kind of focus on building tools that allow companies to stay secure while developing. Uh, so we do that for a couple of tools. We have like a SaaS tool, an SCA tool. We do container scanning, IAC, and just like general AppSec tooling. Um, so if you want to know more, come and speak to me later. Um, and then I work in a team called Security Labs, and we are basically yeah, a small team of just three people. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, the guys on the screen there. Um, and we kind of tend to try and do high impact uh, security research that kind of has an impact on more developers. So we don't really do as much stuff with kind of memory corruption bugs, but we'll be looking at things kind of like Docker or like hugging face, Terraform, um, and just things that have like an impact on general and wider developer security. So what are GitHub Actions? Uh, so GitHub Actions is basically the CI platform um, that's built directly into GitHub. And it's quite similar to things like Jenkins or Circle CI, if you've ever used those. And these allow you to basically do automation. They allow you to automate tasks uh, like building, uh, building your code, running tests, running your SAS scans, or deploying to some environment once those tests finish. Um, and yeah, we define these via workflows. Um, and those workflows exist within the repository itself. Um, so what we're going to have a look into kind of how GitHub Actions works, what its architecture is, uh, some of the key components, and then we'll go into some of uh, how those components can be misused and lead to uh, some issues that can allow us to basically take over organizations' repositories um, based on some of these misconfigurations with some examples. 
So just in case kind of people aren't familiar with how a, a typical GitHub workflow would look like, um, we'll first have a look at what this might look like uh, so then we can see how uh, the kind of GitOps flow works and how GitHub Actions kind of fits into this. Uh, so we basically kind of have a GitHub repository with a main branch where our code exists. Um, and then when we, when we want to add or build a new feature, uh, we don't build directly into main. We typically make a feature branch. And this is kind of separate from the main repository. Um, and then this is where we make our changes. We add our commits. Um, and we do that to the feature branch. And then once we're ready, we open a pull request back to the, the main branch. Um, and then we can yeah, go ahead and merge these, basically. Um, and at this point, uh, we have our code. And it's, uh, it's merged into the repository. So this is all great. Um, and then kind of just like, what are the use cases? And why would we even want to have some sort like continuous integration or continuous delivery? Um, and and it, it's quite useful. So like once we do that merge back into the main branch, like we may be working with external contractors. We may have different development teams all working on the same product project. Um, and yeah, we want to make sure that we have kind of quality control in place or maybe automate deployments. So it's very useful to have some sort of CI and CD. And it allows us to kind of run our unit tests. And basically, if some of those tests fail, then we can reject the pull request and we don't merge it into production. And then we end up with kind of yeah, some, some quality control. And then we can also use it for things like sending Slack notifications or like uh, if, if something breaks in the, the main build or like we, we can basically do anything we want uh, within the life cycle of uh, our GitOps, basically. So kind of now that we understand why you might want to use GitHub Actions, let's have a look at how, uh, how it works so that we're in a good position to kind of explore the threat landscape and see how we can attack and defend uh, GitHub Action-based workflows. So GitHub Actions uh, basically automates the workflows in the repository. Um, and these are triggered by various events like pull requests or somebody creating a comment. Um, and yeah, these can run like either sequentially, in parallel, um, and they're basically made up of jobs. Um, and the jobs are sets of uh, predefined actions. Um, and yeah, th these can simplify our workflows. Uh, so let's kind of start with uh, the, the key, the main key concept of GitHub Actions, which is the workflow. Um, and so what is the workflow? It's basically a YAML file that exists over at the, yeah, in a directory within the repository GitHub uh, slash workflows. Um, and yeah, there we can basically create workflow files by dropping our YAML files in there. We can have multiple workflows by dropping them into separate YAML files. Um, and then, yeah, these are highly configurable. And we can yeah, have a lot of flexibility with how uh, these work and how they're triggered. Um, and we typically have three ways of triggering that with kind of events manually uh, or with like a schedule. Um, so kind of the next level down, we have the workflow, and then we have the events. And the events are basically spe specific activities that are going to trigger the execution of a workflow. Uh, so the kind of common events that uh, we might see are things like pull requests, commits, pushes, issue creations, um, and as well as like some external triggers. So we have uh, kind of like workflow dispatch calls. We may have external API calls that trigger the execution of the workflow. Um, and these are all configured in that YAML file that I've mentioned. Um, and this is done by using the uh, on directive or keyword. And then we can also customize the activation of these workflows uh, so we can have things like event filters. And these allow us to have kind of more granular control. So maybe we don't want every like push to the repository to trigger a workflow or every merge, but we only want this to happen when somebody merges into the main branch. Uh, so we can do that with uh, event filters. And then kind of, yeah, within those uh, yeah, workflows, uh, the basically, we define jobs. Uh, and the job provides us a structured approach to, to basically managing the execution. And each job uh, groups related tasks that are yeah, designed to accomplish kind of a specific task. Um, so this might be running a security scan, yeah, building the code base, or deploying to some environment. Um, and those jobs are broken down into steps, which are basically the individual uh, actions to achieve the task. Um, and each step is basically like a shell script that's uh, just put into the, 
the YAML file, or we may have a pre-built action that we call upon. Um, and we'll discuss this in the next slides. Um, but then, yeah, kind of another important thing. So like when we have these jobs, they basically run uh, within the same environment. So all of those jobs are going to kind of have a new environment uh, specific to that job. Um, and we define these with the, the jobs keyword. And by default, they run in parallel, but you can configure this based on, on your needs. Um, so kind of when we have those jobs, these are further broken down into what we call steps. Uh, and these steps are the building blocks that define the, the individual actions that are required to actually complete that job's like task. Uh, so each step represents a single, well-defined uh, action within the workflow. Um, and we kind of have two main approaches to define these steps. So we can either create uh, with custom shell scripts, as I've mentioned. So we can either have like an inline, just like command, or we may invoke some yeah, shell script that's in our repository. Or we can use uh, an external GitHub action. Uh, so with those GitHub actions, these are shared. Uh, we can access them from the GitHub marketplace. And when we do that, we basically import it from uh, an external repository. Um, and that's kind of predefined things like checking out a repository or like common tasks that we don't want to manually do ourselves every time. Um, and then kind of another important thing I've mentioned, so like when we have those uh, jobs and steps, I mean, these are going to run in, or the, the steps run in the same environment. So each job gets its own environment, um, and then the steps have a shared environment. Uh, and this is kind of useful. So if we have, for example, two steps inside one job, one pulls down some code from a, a URL, um, and then it does something with that. Um, so they will share the same kind of disk in that, in that environment. It will also have the same uh, kind of network. Um, it will have the same uh, volume mounts. So we can kind of persist data within that step. Um, and then, yeah, by default, they run one after another um, unless otherwise specified. And this is kind of expected. Like We want to download some code and then do something with it. And then we have the concept of the pre-built actions. So these are basically code modules uh, that yeah, automate those specific tasks, like pulling down some code from GitHub. Um, and yeah, basically eliminates the need for repetitive code. Um, and then, yeah, basically when we want to use these pre-built actions, uh, we can simply reference these uh, yeah, within our workflow in the YAML file by using the users keyword. Um, and there are kind of three ways to locate or reference an action, we can either use a local action, uh, which we basically do by having like a, a dot slash notation and pointing it to some uh, resource within our repository that we've checked out. Uh, we can also kind of point it to a GitHub repository by using the, the owner slash uh, the repo and then the reference of the, the commit. Um, or we can use Docker where we can point it directly to some yeah, Docker image and it will go ahead and spin this up and run it. Um, so, and then, yeah, we have the marketplace where publicly available actions exist. Uh, there we go. Um, and then when it comes down to actually running and executing these GitHub actions, we have two options, basically. So GitHub provides hosted runners. Um, and these runners are basically managed by GitHub, and they take care of the infrastructure, ensuring that they're available. Um, whereas in contrast, we can also have self-hosted runners. But when we use self-hosted runners, these are going to run on our infrastructure in our cloud environment or our on-prem. Um, so I mean, it, it gives us full control over what happens there. Um, but there's some pros and cons and trade-offs between them. So kind of when we look at the environment consistency with the GitHub hosted runners, every time uh, that a new job runs, we basically have a, a fresh virtual machine, essentially. Uh, so there's no like leftover artifacts left there. Um, whereas with a, a self-hosted runner, they are going to remain. Um, and this could be useful, uh, or it could kind of just get messy. Um, so that's kind of one of the things. Um, and then we have kind of like limited customization over the runners. So when we use some one of the GitHub hosted runners, uh, we basically only have three options for kind of the operating system. Uh, we can just say whether we want a Linux, a Windows, or a Mac uh, container to run those uh, jobs. Whereas with um, yeah, when, when we use a self-hosted one, we have complete control. So we can like 
have all of our pre-installed scripts that we need, et cetera, to kind of yeah, have any task that we want to perform. So everything's already ready for us. Um, and then, yeah, kind of finally, the last one's kind of obvious, but any security issues within the base images or kind of the operating system uh, with the GitHub hosted runners, that's going to be handled by GitHub. So we don't need to worry about patching them. Uh, whereas with our self hosted runners, as your security team, you're going to need to make sure that you're updating and patching these and keeping them in a, in a reasonable state. So, kind of, what does this all look like? So, here we have just a kind of a basic uh, yeah, YAML file, um, and kind of we have up here the workflow name, and then here we have uh, basically the uh, the event trigger, and we have uh, push. So this will trigger on a push event, and then we have basically an event filter here. So this will only trigger on pushes to the main branch, um, and then we have kind of two jobs that we've defined. So we have job one, job two. Um, and then, yeah, the first one, this runs on Ubuntu. So this is basically the runner that we've defined. And then we have some steps here. So we basically have a checkout, and then we run some commands. So this is the actual step. This is uh, the job. Um, and this one's using a shell script. Um, and then down here, we have a second job. And this one depends on the successful execution of job one. Uh, so this is kind of how we can also manage the kind of execution flow and how things are actually run. Um, and that's basically a, a simple YAML file. Uh, so kind of then we have the GitHub token. Uh, and this is an automatically generated temporary token that's provided for every time, uh, it's provided by GitHub every time a workflow runs. And this allows our workflows to authenticate against GitHub um, services. So, and it, it's basically scoped to the workflow and it's accessible via the secrets.github token context. Um, so, and yeah, this, this token enables us to perform actions like uh, cloning repositories, pushing commits. Uh, uploading artifacts to some place or kind of just interacting with the GitHub API. Um, and th there's some interesting quirks regarding the, the kind of permissioning of these tokens. Uh, so before, uh, yeah, 2002, uh, sorry, 2022, uh, any organizations that were created before 22, uh, the default permission sets on these, this GitHub token was read write. Um, and this has now been changed uh, for organizations that were created after. We now only have uh, the read permission. Um, and this isn't for repositories created after 2022. Like if your actual organization was created before, uh, then any f new repositories that you create will also inherit the default permission, which is read-write. Um, but we can customize this via the, um, the workflow file or in the uh, settings within GitHub. Um, and yeah. Let's see how we can do that. So you might be wondering how we actually uh, change the scope. Um, and yeah, we can change this at the enterprise level, uh, the organization, or at the specific repository level. Um, and to do that, we just need to go to the appropriate settings page, go to the select actions, then general. Um, and then there, we can basically ch set the uh, permission for the, the token. And while that's very powerful, um, it doesn't give us much fine-grained control. So there's a lot of different things that can actually, uh, that we can use that API to speak to or various services. Um, and just setting it broadly to read-write could be quite dangerous. So we can also further customize these um, by using the permission scopes. Um, and here we have things like actions, checks, deployments, pull requests, and we can kind of give more strict and fine-grained access. Um, the documentation for these is uh, could be improved, and it's often quite difficult to actually know uh, which permission gives you access to the thing that you want. So you might end up exposing in, uh, yeah, certain things that you don't want to. Um, and but for the purposes of kind of exploiting GitHub Actions, there's a main uh, couple of uh, permissions that we want. Um, the first one is contents, and this is the most important one. And when we have kind of write access to uh, contents, this allows us to basically make changes to the actual repository itself. Um, and then interestingly, we have the, the pull requests uh, scope. Um, and it might seem like this one, if 
you have access, you might be able to merge a pull request, but uh, that's not the case, unfortunately, and uh, it only gives you access to kind of operate on the pull request, so you can add comments and things like that, but you can't actually uh, do any merges. For that, we need the, the contents, right? Um, so kind of let's move on to secrets. Um, and these are basically essential vari essentially variables that can, uh, yeah, we include at different levels within GitHub, uh, such as yeah, the organization repository. Um, and these are basically there to allow us to perform tasks like interacting with a third party service. So we may store API keys there, tokens, passwords. Um, and it, we may be pushing to Docker Hub once we have a successful build. Uh, we may be storing the results of our SaaS scan or pushing to AWS. So we need to, a way to store those secrets. You can also use OIDC, um, but this is a bit more complicated and kind of outside the scope of uh, the talk that we're doing today. Um, but one kind of interesting point is regarding the implicit or yeah, the, 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 explicit, the explicit nature that we need to import the secrets. So even if we kind of have a secret defined in our repository, it doesn't mean that we can access it. Um, so as we're going to see kind of... Uh, there's a, yeah, basically um, over here, uh, we have kind of yeah, our secret, and in the step, uh, we're basically using this with uh, the with. Um, so this is making uh, this secret that's in the secrets context um, and assigning it to this super secret variable. Um, we can do that in two ways, using with or uh, env. Um, but if we didn't have that, if we had kind of some script that tried to access uh, this secret, it wouldn't be there. So it's not. Uh, it, like we need to explicitly request access to it, essentially. Uh, so kind of we're, we're 27 slides in, and we've not covered uh, any vulnerabilities yet. We've only discussed kind of what, what is a branch and uh, what is GitHub Actions. Uh, so let's kind of now look at some of the vulnerabilities uh, and misconfigurations that we might see when we're auditing um, and yeah, searching for that next bounty payout. So kind of first up, we have the typical command command injection. And these can occur in GitHub Actions when we basically have some user input that is unsafely passed to some script or vulnerable actions within a workflow. Um, and there are many events uh, within GitHub that kind of allow user controllable input. We have things like the, the comment body, the issue title, uh, kind of the, the author's name, the author's email address. And if those are not properly sanitized, uh, then yeah, this can lead to typical injection attacks where we might do like a, com a, a command substitution with ID or shutdown, and uh, it, it may just cause some problems for uh, our jobs. Um, so kind of what does a vulnerable action look like? Uh, so kind of here we have basically uh, something that issues a Slack notification on an issue. We basically open this. Um, so when the issue is opened, we're going to run this. Um, and then we basically check out the repository. Uh, we make our script writable. And then we have kind of here where we invoke this script and we pass in uh, the title of the issue uh, to send the Slack notification. So I'll receive a message in Slack that says, uh, yeah, a new issue with this title. Um, and this is kind of your typical command injection. Um, we have some basically input that's being passed to a shell argument. Um, and if we go ahead and like uh, put an issue, uh, create an issue with uh, our payload, in this case it's just yeah, ID, uh, we go ahead and run that. If we look at the uh, results of the uh, workflow running, we can see that we have command execution uh, within that workflow. Um, so kind of how do we uh, mitigate this? We can basically use uh, an intermediary value where instead of directly passing the, the title to the, the shell script, we can bind this to uh, an intermediary environment variable, and then this won't be expanded, and we can safely pass this as an argument to run. And uh, you see that once this runs, uh, we don't have command execution anymore. So that's kind of easy to fix. Um, and then kind of we have forks and pull requests, and this is where things get a bit more interesting. Um, and kind of one particularly problematic feature in GitHub is yeah, how these are handled um, and kind of the differences between like the scope in which jobs will execute. So we have kind of two main uh, events for handling pull requests. One is pull request and then one's pull request target. Um, with the uh, original pull request one, uh, this executes uh, within the context of the fork. 
Um, and we only have access to kind of a read uh, GitHub token. Um, and it doesn't give us access to any secrets. Um, so this is like there typically, uh, the original one, um, but it was quite limiting because it doesn't allow us to do much because we can't access the secrets. We don't only have read access. Um, and then, yeah, pull request target was introduced to kind of uh, expand these capabilities. And here, we, the when we open a pull request, uh, the job is going to run in the context of the base repository um, and not the, the repository that I, as an attacker, um, have tried to merge. Um, and with this, we can access the secrets, and uh, we often have the, the read-write permission, but this is dependent on when the organization was created. Which leads us to a vulnerability class called POEM request. Um, and this POEM request occurs when uh, a workflow basically mishandles the uh, pull request target trigger, um, and this potentially compromises the GitHub token, and it leaks secrets. Uh, so these specific conditions must be met for us to kind of make this exploitable. We first need to control a pull request target event. So uh, there'll be a repository with a pull request target event. We can open a pull request, and then this is going to trigger. Great. Um, and then we need basically a couple of other things. So inside the, uh, the workflow, it needs to then check out from uh, the target of the pull request. So our repository that we control instead of the main repository, um, which is quite common. Um, and then we need some basically some code execution or an injection point uh, to basically take control over this. So kind of this is what a vulnerable workflow looks like. Um, and yeah, here our job meets all of these requirements. So. We have over here a pull request target event that basically any time the pull request is changed or opened. Um, and then we have a step here. So this pulls out, uh, checks out the code from our pull request. Um, and then it basically, a standard job that you might see where we build and pull some dependencies. So we basically invoke a make file. Uh, so to kind of exploit this, we'll just modify in our pull request. Uh, we'll add and and ID uh, to the make file. And then when this is run, uh, we'll see that that actually takes our code and executes this. Um, so it, it's kind of a difficult issue to fix because it's often a result as uh, kind of using the wrong tool for the job. Um, and specifically when using uh, the pull request target in GitHub Actions, we need to make extra care to make sure that uh, we don't do privileged actions because it's executing in the context of the base repository with stuff that an attacker can control. Um, so there's a couple of compensating controls that we can do here. So we can configure the workflows to only run for contributors. So in, in this case, if I, as an attacker, open a pull request, um, it's not going to run the workflow straight away because I'm not a contributor. But this isn't a, a difficult hurdle to overcome um, because we can just go through the, the repository, find a typo in some readme file, fix this, and then at that point, we're contributor. Um, and then any further uh, pull requests from us will be automatically uh, running the workflows. So that one's uh, not too difficult to bypass. We also then have kind of repository environments. And uh, there's a, a setting called require approvers. Um, and when we use the required approvers, it will basically not run the workflow until somebody in a defined list goes ahead and clicks that they want this to run. Um, but again, this is not the strongest control uh, because often like these pull requests are used to check the quality of what's being committed. Um, so it may be running some tests, running a SAS scan, um, and it's there's no reason to think that code from the attacker is going to execute when those jobs run. So in most cases, we found actually uh, people will just click yes, um, and, and it's not a huge problem. Um, so kind of... Uh, yeah, when we when this uh, pull request target event was introduced, um, they also introduced another um, event type called workflow run, and this basically allows us to 
have some degree of fixing this. So we can basically separate our jobs into two workflows uh, where we have one unprivileged workflow and then one privileged workflow that will perform some sensitive action that has access to the secrets. And the workflow wa run can basically just be configured to uh, watch for successful execution of the, the untrusted workflow. And when that happens, it will go ahead and yeah, do something else. Um, so kind of yeah, how do we kind of uh, exploit this? Um, so yeah, as we mentioned, it allows us to kind of run some privileged operation uh, on untrusted code. But this by itself, I mean, it represents uh, a security boundary. Um, so kind of in order for the, this to be kind of abused, um, well, that by itself can fix things, but we can still abuse this. So uh, basically, when we have kind of those two, um, we, we fixed kind of the pull request issue or the poem request, but then we have a situation where we have this trust boundary and we have the, the untrusted job that's running, and then the privileged job, it may do something dangerous with the results of the untrusted job. So in those cases, uh, it may kind of, yeah, do like a build, um, and then if that runs successfully, it test completes, it will go ahead and then check out the code from that branch, and then yeah, run some further tests on it, um, and then push those results to a code coverage tool. Um, and in that case, we're able to kind of take control of this still. So how this would look in practice, we basically have the unprivileged pull request event, um, and this one basically just does a, a checkout. It sets up Node, it does an NPM install, and it runs the tests. When that's successful, we then have a, a privileged workflow that's using workflow run. When it's completed successfully, it's then going to check out from the, the head of the workflow uh, of this, repos uh, this one. Um, and then it's going to yeah, do some action. In this case, it's just an example. So we're just doing an NPM install. Um, but in a more likely scenario, we're just going to push the results to some service. Um, and that's going to require secrets. And at that point, uh, we control those secrets. Um, so yeah, in this case, we have code execution within uh, the privileged job instead of the unprivileged job. So kind of that's uh, useful. But we kind of want some kind of like hack tricks to help us uh, get around some other kind of situations that we may have. Um, so kind of when we want to take control over a job, um, it's not always obvious. Like we may not have a kind of direct uh, command injection that's there. Um, so like we can look for things that we control. So maybe there's a make file. Maybe there's a shell script that's being checked out. And we can put our code in there. And this may work. That's not always the case, though. So there's some really good uh, kind of collection of resources called uh, Living Off the Pipeline. Um, and in here, it's got a whole list of uh, systems that, uh, when they're used, we can control one file. Uh, for example, with like an NPM install, if we just have the NPM install that's being run, we can get command execution through this by uh, modifying the package.json file and putting in there uh, a, a, post, a script tag, uh, so like a pre-install script. Um, and then this will give us a command execution when NPM runs. And the same of things like pip, make, uh, eslint, they all provide us ways to get some code execution. So um, we can also use local um, local actions. So if we're referencing an action that's not on the marketplace, but it's uh, being referenced with dot slash, um, this basically just points to act like a, a default YAML file called action.yaml in the base repository. Um, and then in there, we can basically configure which job is going to uh, run. One of the things that's really uh, more useful, though, um, is kind of step poisoning. And this is basically where we have control over uh, a partial step. So kind of here we have, uh, yeah, down here we have this deploy to S3 step. And inside here we have the environment uh, variables exposed to us where the secrets. Um, but we don't have code execution in this step. Whereas we only have code execution here, but we don't have access to those secrets. So if we tried here to actually access uh, these AWS keys, it's going to fail, and they're just going to be undefined. Um, so yeah, how can we gain access to those from uh, the step that we have uh, control over? Um, and yeah, we found that there's a 
well, we, we were looking at uh, environment variables to see how, how this could work, and we found one that may be useful. So we were looking at node options, um, but we found that, yeah, a lot of these are actually restricted, and when you try to set them, it's uh, not going to work. Um, but we found that LD preload seemed to have been forgotten. So, I mean, LD preload uh, basically allows us to replace kind of the definition of some function or sh uh, by w when we try to invoke some function that's in a library, we can provide uh, a separate library that's going to be run instead. Um, so basically what we can do to abuse this, we basically just have uh, like here, here is the payload um, and we basically have a the step that compiles our shared object. Um, and down here, we basically just uh, yeah, compile this, um, and the, the shared object will just output the secrets that we want to the, to the screen. And that's yeah, quite useful. Um, it allows us to kind of bypass this. So in those steps, um, once it's got to that final step that we had no control over, it's gone ahead and printed the output of uh, the AWS secret. So kind of let's get to some uh, real findings um, and some of the things that we found uh, using these techniques. Um, so OWASP, this, this is quite a, an interesting one just because it's a bit ironic that it's in a repository owned by OWASP for the, the web security testing guide. Um, and yeah, we found that they were vulnerable to a POEM request. Um, and they basically were running a tool called TextLintRC um, from the pull request branch um, inside the, the TextLint check uh, step. Uh, TextLint RC also supports JavaScript format, um, so we were able to just replace the JSON format uh, that was uh, in this rule definition um, with some JavaScript, and then use LD preload to hijack this, the, the previous steps, um, and then access the GitHub token. So kind of, uh, oh, well, also when we did that, the, the only problem here was that uh, it only had the pull request write uh, permission, so we weren't actually able to do much. We could only uh, write messages to the pull requests. Um, so this one's a bit lame, uh, but it was just yeah, a bit ironic that it was in the OWASP repository. Um, the second one that's more interesting uh, is in a repository from Microsoft called Autogen, and it's basically an AI agent framework, so something similar to Langchain. Um, and they had a couple of jobs that were vulnerable, um, and uh, yeah, the contrib open AI was vulnerable to a poem request too in the retrieve chat test job. Um, and yeah, here we have some more interesting secrets. So. We have kind of some, some Azure open AI API keys. Uh, so yeah, when basically looking at this one, we're able to get some secrets that are owned by Microsoft um, to access one of their open AI accounts. Um, and once we go ahead and access that, we can see that we have access to those API keys. Um, and then kind of the final one that we, we're going to talk about is uh, from HashiCorp, uh, which is the company that maintains Terraform. And they have the Terraform uh, CDK action. Um, and there they have an integrations test YAML file. Um, and this was also subject to a POEM request. Um, and here they had two steps, uh, or yeah, two steps that allow control to be uh, taken, uh, the install dependencies and integration tests. Uh, one used yarn install, um, which again, via a package.json we can overtake, um, and the other one was with a local action. Uh, so kind of with this one, uh, here we have the, the local action, so it's using uh, dot slash, um, and uh, here's the yarn install. Um, and down here we have uh, this GitHub token. Uh, so in this case, we can go ahead and steal uh, this GitHub token. So kind of how do we yeah, exploit this? What are we going to do? Um, so we basically build a payload that would automatically uh, merge our pull request. So uh, as soon as we get the code execution, we basically make a request to the GitHub API. Um, and then we pass in that GitHub token that we were able to steal. 
um, and then yeah, make the commit title pwned. Um, and then once we go ahead and uh, that pull request runs, uh, we can see that we have the, the command execution. Uh, we are able to basically test the token. We make our curl request. Um, and as we can see from the response of this, we see uh, merged is true. Pull request successfully merged. And then when we go to the repository, uh, we see that the uh, pull request was merged without any interaction. So in these cases, uh, we could just open a pull request and as soon as the job finishes, our uh, pull request is merged into the main branch without any uh, interaction from any, any maintainers or contributors. Um, and then, yeah, in order for us to basically scan issues uh, in GitHub repo, uh, yeah, in our repos, uh, we created a CLI tool called the GitHub Action Scanner. Um, and basically, you can give it uh, a URL um, or an organization, and it will go ahead, parse all the YAML files, um, and then we use basically like a regex-based rule engine to find and flag findings. Um, so there's currently seven rules uh, in there, um, and it's got a couple of interesting features that are quite useful. So one of them is for kind of making it easier, yeah. easier to test and proof of concept uh, these findings. So when you're kind of, you found a repository that's vulnerable, you don't want to be testing this against the actual live repository because uh, it's going to be noisy and you have a potential to kind of break things. Um, so you basically make a copy of the repository, um, make a new repository and then upload that. And then you make a pull request against, or well you fork and pull request into uh, your copy of the original repository. Um, so the tool allows us just with uh, a single command to basically make a new repository that is a clone of the original one, uh, which is quite useful. We also have a, a, a payload generator, which will automatically generate the LD preload file um, for yeah, running these payloads that allow us to kind of do step poisoning attacks. Um, and then also repository uh, discovery. So there's kind of a quite a useful feature where you can basically say scan GitHub for all repositories within between 5,000 and 20,000 stars. Um, and it will go ahead and enumerate all of the repositories and then it will run the rules against each one of those. So it's very useful for finding these kind of issues on mass. Uh, so kind of, yeah, just to, to summarize, um, yeah, GitHub actions are great and we can do a lot with them. Um, but it can also be quite dangerous when they're used in public repositories. So first of all, I mean, like, be careful when you're using GitHub Actions in a public repository. Um, and generally, you'll want to use the pull request event instead of pull request target. Um, so be careful about which triggers that you're using. Um, and then also be careful cautious about what, where user controllable input can come from or what scripts a user may have control over. Um, and again, yeah, if you are using public repos with GitHub Actions, don't use public runners uh, because any uh, command execution there will allow kind of that machine to be taken over. And at that point, you also have kind of access to the network where that's deployed. And if it's not properly firewalled off, then things could go wrong there. Um, and yeah, the, these issues are very common. So if you go ahead and take uh, the scanner and start searching, like you will find a lot of issues um, and yeah, report them responsibly and don't cause too much uh, problems. Um, all of those three issues uh, are also fixed and responsibly disclosed. Um, and yeah, thank you for taking the time to listen and I hope that yeah, you learned something about GitHub Actions. So we have some minutes for questions, if there are any. We have one. Yep, there is a question, and there is a box. And here we go. Uh, any vulnerabilities in private repositories <coughs> that you know about or have recently discovered? Um, no, so kind of with the, the focus of this, um, it's kind of more interesting to look at the public repositories because like anybody can find them. Um, with private repositories, of course, there is a concern there, but the like uh, window for attackers is a lot smaller uh, because I mean you're 
you're limited to people that are already trusted to access those private repositories. Uh, so we, we didn't really look at this. I mean, we would have been restricted to looking at our own company's private repositories. Okay, thanks. Any uh, other takers? Yes, no, maybe. Oh, there we go. Uh, just a question. Do you know if GitLab has similar issues? I don't think they Yes. Do. Uh, so all, all of the kind of CI platforms have similar issues with the uh, kind of just the flow of how these workflows are triggered. Um, but we decided to focus our efforts on GitHub because the majority of public repos we found are hosted on GitHub over GitLab. Um, so yeah, while we didn't spend any time to, to look at this, uh, very similar issues uh, do affect GitLab and Jenkins and CircleCI. Because I think the only protection mechanism which is there is that you make a secure variable that only runs on a secure uh, branch that runs on a secure runner or protected, which means if the branch is protected and, uh, and the, it only runs on a protected branch, all those things shouldn't happen, right? Um, I mean, it, de it depends on like how their triggers work. I mean, if it executes in the context of, a, of the protected branch, then maybe. Um, Post only on protected branches, and I believe merge requests and other things don't run in the context of a branch. They're in this ephemeral middle region. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, like we focused on GitHub, um, so there's definitely further research to be done on GitLab, and uh, maybe there's a way to kind of get this, but maybe it's more difficult. Uh, but I don't know. <laughs> Uh, right, so uh, when you run the GitHub action, it creates you, for you a, a container or virtual machine or something like that, right? Uh, is there, like, is there any way to like return the machine to a, like the starting state between steps or jobs, or is it always uh, does it always like retain the changes made by previous steps in it? Yes, yeah, so, so but by running a new job, uh, mm. this will run in a separate container. Um, it will only be steps that are going to share the same container or the same environment that it's executing in. Um, unless you're yeah, using self-hosted runners, and then you're, you're on your own and you are responsible for cleaning up. But is there like any reason to not do new jobs every time unless you want to retain the state? Uh, yes, so I mean, it would be situations where like, you need to share some information between the steps. Um, so like first installing the dependencies and then running the tests because maybe to run those tests as part of your testing framework, you need or you rely on like JUnit or something. Uh. Thank you. Our Q&A time has come to an end at this point, but there's soon going to be another break and you can ask your sure. questions there. And before we get another speaker go, here's something for the skateboarding. Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you.